and help them to get another job. Whenever I have to let someone go in my company, I make a, de make a bad decision, is I go to them and I tell them that this is not the right job for you and I'll help you find another job somewhere else. And when they find another job somewhere else, the company takes them out for lunch and we celebrate they're going on to another job. And so we don't have any negative emotions about helping people move on. Now supervising is where you make sure that people do the job. Supervising is where you set very clear jobs and then you set schedules for measuring the job. You set standards of performance. Supervising is almost like a doctor where the doctor goes in and checks the pulse of the patient. Well, you are always checking the pulse of the job. Remember that delegation is not abdication. When you delegate a job, you still own the job and you're still responsible for the results. So you don't just give the job away completely. You, give, you delegate the job and then you watch the job and make sure that it's done on time. Sometimes I will delegate a task and I will check once a week, once every two weeks. Sometimes I will delegate a task and I will check once a day. Sometimes if it's a really important task, I will talk to the person twice a day because it's really important. Now here's what we have found is that when you check on a regular basis, when you meet and discuss the task on a regular basis with your staff member, they come to believe that this task is important and therefore they are important. And so you actually raise people's self-esteem by continually checking on the task. You don't take the task back and you don't tell people what to do. You just keep in touch and ask for progress. Now the sixth key quality or skill of leaders or role is measuring. And measuring is where you set standards of performance for everything that you want done. Measuring is where you make it clear exactly how success is going to be measured. There's a rule in management that says, if you can't measure it, you cannot manage it. And there's a second rule that says, what gets measured gets done. So let's talk now about leadership styles. Is there are many different leadership styles and the leadership style that you choose depends upon the situation. Not only that, you may have to use different leadership styles at different times. If you are, uh, in a, in a happy situation, you can ask people to do things. If the building is on fire, your leadership style is far more direct uh, and commanding. Remember, if the building is on fire, you don't want to go to people and say, how are you today? <laughs> Would you like to leave the building? <laughs> how do you feel about that? <laughs> you have to be much more direct. When you are dealing with people who have high leadership, high, high levels of skill, you just need to point out or explain the job and they can do it. In my company, this month and last month, I am gone for seven weeks. I do not go to my office for seven weeks. I telephone or I sometimes email, but my company runs very smoothly. Why? It's because everybody is experienced and they all know their jobs and they don't need direction or orders from me. Here is an interesting discovery. You can tell how well organized you are by how long you can be gone before you start to have problems. Some people are such bad managers that if they're gone for one day, problems begin immediately. Other managers are such good managers that they can go away for a month and there's no problems at all. The worst places to work are where people are terrified of making a mistake because their bosses are angry and their bosses criticize them and their bosses embarrass them in front of other people. So what makes a great company, number one, is a high level of trust. People feel they can make a mistake and they're okay. And I read that many years ago and I started doing the same thing with my children. And when my children make a mistake, I say it's okay, people make mistakes. There is nothing more frustrating to a child than to have their parents continually remind them of a mistake they made in the past that they can't change. And so therefore, once a mistake has been made, let it go and concentrate on the future. Concentrate on your goals. Concentrate on what you're trying to accomplish. When your staff members make a mistake, discuss it and say, okay, <laughs> what did you learn from this situation? And they'll say, well, I learned this and I learned that. 
You will say, that's good. Well, that's a good learning experience. And then drop the subject and never bring it up again. Very important. And what I have found is when my staff makes a mistake, instead of being angry, I say, why did you do that? And they explain it to me. And you know something? Their explanations are always good explanations. It was, it's a reasonable explanation. It, it was not a crazy thing to do. Based on the information they had, it was a reasonable decision. It didn't work out properly, but they acted on the best of intentions. If you want to be a great manager, always assume that people are acting on the best of intentions. Always assume that people are doing the best they can. And then never criticize people. Allow people to make mistakes without feeling bad about themselves. My point is that we get really angry, and so we go from zero, and we get really angry up here. Go all the way up to the top of the curve, and we become angry. Now, the test of how mature you are as an adult is how long you stay angry. It's OK to become angry when things go wrong. It's normal. When we're disappointed or frustrated or something goes wrong, it's OK for us to become angry. But the question then is, how long does it take for you to go right back down to zero? And this is called your forgetting curve. And you'll find that successful people have a steep forgetting curve. They forget very quickly. Unsuccessful people, unhappy people, people who sometimes have to go to psychologists and psychiatrists are people who never forget. Their forgetting curve is straight. 10 years later, they're still angry <laughs> because of something that happened. Do you know anybody like this? Yes. Successful people, healthy people, forget about things in the past and focus on the future. There's a wonderful little line that says that when you turn toward the sunshine, the shadows fall behind you. When you think about where you're going and what you want to accomplish, the negative stuff just falls behind you. And that is the key to being a positive and happy person, is keep turning toward the sunshine and forget about the things that happened in the past. So the kindest thing that you can do for your staff is to make it clear to them what you expect them to do. Many times I have been frustrated with my staff almost to the point where I'm ready to fire them and, and send them out of my company. And then I say, wait a minute, is this a fair thing to do? And then I realize that they're doing the best they can, but it's me who has not made it clear what I want them to do. Have you ever found a staff member working on something and you say, what, what, what are you doing there? Well, I'm doing this. Well, why are you doing that? Well, you told me to do this. Yes, but that's something to do when you have spare time. This is your most important job over here. Oh, you didn't tell me that. So I'm doing the best I can on this job because you didn't tell me that something else was more important. Have you had that experience? Of course, we've all had that experience. So you are the leader and you are responsible. If your staff member is not working on the most important job, then you are responsible for making it clear that this job is most important. The second part is regular, the second characteristic or quality of top leaders is regular interaction with their employees. They find that top, top people spend 75% of their time interacting with their employees. Top managers are constantly talking to people and walking around and asking them questions and listening to them. Poor managers stay in their office and often stay in their office with their door closed. These are the worst managers of all because they don't know what's going on. Have you ever had an experience where your wife, if you're a man, okay, and you have children, and young children, and your wife says, I have to go shopping. Will you watch the children? You ever had that experience? And wives are very nervous about leaving their children with their husbands. <laughs> because husbands are like this. We, we say, sure, leave the children with me. But you have to watch the children. OK, I'll watch the children. And then you go off and watch television. 
And your wife goes shopping, and half an hour later she calls, and she says, how are the children? I don't know. I haven't seen them for half an hour. <laughs> it's the same with bad managers. Bad managers stay in their offices, and they don't know what the children are doing. Now, I had a new job opening for a senior executive in one of my companies a few years ago. And I sat down and I wrote down 38 things that I wanted the perfect person to have. Two weeks later, someone phoned and said, I know about your company and I wonder if there is a job opening there for me. And I said, well, so what do you do? And he began to describe his experience and I said, please come to my office so we can discuss it. And I, would, I will give you 30 minutes. So we sat down for a 30 minute interview and we stayed there for three hours. And at the end of three hours, I realized he had all 38 things on my list. He was the absolute perfect person. It was just almost like a miracle, but it's not a miracle, it's a technique that works. So write down, think on paper, and write down every detail of the perfect person. We judge ourselves as adults on what we feel we can do in the future. But we are judged by others by what we have done in the past. There is a great line from Henry Ford that says, you can't build a reputation on what you are going to do. It's a very interesting observation. You can only build a reputation on what you've already done successfully. So when you interview people, always look for success experiences. Always make sure that they have already succeeded at what you are hiring them to do. Now, does this mean that you cannot hire new people and train them? Well, it depends upon the size of your business. And the smaller the company, the greater the danger for hiring inexperienced people. Because one inexperienced person in a key position can bankrupt your company. So here's the formula, and it's very simple. First of all, look for someone who is smart. There is a correlation of 72% between intelligence and business success. So they can have education and they can have personality, but 72% of their success will be explained by how smart they are. Now, how can you tell if a person is smart? Well, a smart person is curious. The mark of the smart person is that they are curious. What do curious people do? They ask a lot of questions. They ask questions about the company. They ask questions about you. They ask questions about the industry. They ask questions about the economy. They're curious. That's one of the best indications of smart people is that they ask a lot of questions. If you're interviewing somebody and they don't have any questions, this is not a good sign. <laughs> it's not a good sign. So always ask them, do you have any questions? If their questions are, do you have a retirement plan? <laughs> and how many days off do I get? You know, and so on. If those are their questions, run, because you're talking to a duck. Quack, 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 quack. And you don't want more ducks in your company. Okay, number two is they work hard. You are looking for somebody who's a hard worker. Now, <laughs> what? I missed that. I'm going to go back to the booth and find out what they're saying. All right. I, I said work hard. Is that a joke in Poland? <laughs> that's, that's the first time in my life a whole room has laughed at the idea of working hard. Now here, here is a sad fact. The sad fact is that most people are lazy. What is, what is one of the greatest enemies of success? A great enemy of success is called the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is the natural tendency for people to do things the easy way. Human beings are always looking for an easy way to get a result. And if you do something habitually over and over, 
eventually all you look for is the easy way. And you don't work hard when you're at work, and you even resent the idea that you should work hard. So you'll find that the top 20% of people are hard workers. And these people, as I explained earlier, produce five times as much as lazy people. So you're looking for people who are hard workers. And how do you find a hard worker? Well, what I find is you ask a question. And the question is, sometimes we have to work long hours and weekends to get the job done here because we are, we are very busy or we are under a lot of pressure. How would you feel about working long days and weekends? You ask the question and wait for the answer. Now the right person will say, I will do whatever is necessary to be successful at the job. They have no problems with working long hours. The weak person will say, oh, I don't like to work at night and I have to watch my television and, and I don't like to work on weekends because I have social obligations and they'll be very uncomfortable when you ask them about working long hours. A person who will not work long hours in the interview is going to be lazy when they take the job. So you say, well, thank you very much. Make a note. Doesn't like to work hard. Okay. Now, the, um, the third thing you look for is a person who is ambitious. And when we talk about a person who is ambitious, you're talking about a person who is eager to get ahead. Is they look upon this job as an opportunity to be more successful in the future. So you ask them, where would you like to be in five years? What, what are your goals? A person who says, I don't know, is not ambitious. A person who says, I want your job in five years, is ambitious. If they can see that working hard will help them to advance, they will, be, they will work much harder and much smarter than if they have no ambitions at all. Ambitious people are always the best people to hire, especially in a competitive economy. And the fourth quality is that they are nice. You are looking for people who are nice people. Now what is a nice person? They are warm and they're friendly and you like their personality. So, so only hire people that you personally like. Now there's a big mistake that we make as managers is we talk too much in the interview. We talk about the company and we talk about the company, what the company does and we try to impress the person with how good our company is. But here is one of the great rules is don't start selling until you have decided to buy. In other words, don't start talking about your company until you've decided to hire the person. Is take your time. Um, fast hiring decisions are almost always bad hiring decisions. Each of us, when we're younger, hires people quickly. We meet somebody with a nice personality, and since we're emotional, we hire them. And then later we find we've made a terrible mistake. The time to think carefully is before you hire the person not after you hire the person. Because then, sometimes it can be very difficult to correct the mistake. Is always interview at least three people for the job. Never hire the first person that you talk to. Always interview at least three people. Sometimes people say, well, I can't find three people. If you can't find three people, something is wrong with the job. And you need to change the, the design of the job or you need to change the salary that you're offering. Because if it is a good job, there will be lots of people who want it. So always interview three candidates because once you have seen three candidates, you can think with greater clarity about which candidate is the best. Then, number two, is when you have selected a candidate that you like, interview that person three times. Is never hire them the first time or the second time. Always interview them three times. And when you interview them three times, remember this, the first time you interview a person is the best that they will ever look in your history. They will never look better. They will be polite, they will be well dressed, they will be punctual, they will be friendly, they will be everything the first time. So when you bring them back a second time, you will see them differently because you've now had time to think about it. When you bring them back a third time, you will see them very differently. I've had the experience where I have interviewed a person that looked excellent the first time, that looked average 
the second time, and terrible the third time. Now number three is three places. Interview the person in three different places. Because people actually change their personality when you move them around. So interview the person in your office, and then interview the person down the hall in another room, or take the person across the street to a coffee shop or a restaurant and interview them for the third time. Check resumes and references carefully. In other words, people often lie on a resume. Over 50% of resumes are false in that they give experience that they don't have, a uh, level of authority or position that they didn't have, or they give results that they never got. So always check. 